Welcome to The Artistic Process. This is episode eight, The Artist and the Best Part. I'm your host, Julia Tripoli, and as always, each episode is brought to you by Movement Apparel, which is currently on sale at Tripoli Studios right now until the end of July at an extra fun summer discounted rate. So check them out if you come to take class. If not, look them up on Instagram or movementapparel.ca and use my discount code, I am an artist, at checkout for 15% off. I am so excited to have this very special guest on today, someone who is near and dear to my heart, who has done an amazing job at inspiring the entire dance community and quite frankly, even the world. He was on Ellen for just being exactly himself. Luca Lazy Legs Pacioli and his daughter Aura are here today. Welcome, let's get started. to welcome my dear friend Luca Lazy Legs Fatuelli to the podcast. We've been friends for 20 years, I think. Oh my goodness gracious. 18 um, years. 18, 18, years, 18 <laughs> years. Yeah, I'm making, I'm making us older than we actually are. 18 years. Um, and I've kind of always viewed you as this superhero icon, to be perfectly mm-hmm. honest, even though you were my friend. Um, but I know it wasn't you know, always like that. I think a lot of people view you as this kind of role model, icon, superhero, (laughs) superstar, but obviously that's not how you began. And I want to let the people know a little bit about from young Luca to lazy legs, let's say. Young Luca to lazy legs. Yeah. What's up, Julia? How's it going, everyone? Um, So my name is Luca. Uh, I am um, with my daughter, Aura right now. How do I do Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> um, Luca Patuelli. I am a, a Canadian born in Montreal, but I was raised in Washington, D.C., or Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., and my parents are Italian uh, from Italy. Um, and I um, I guess I, 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 I'm Italian Canadian American. All of uh, yes, <laughs> I'm a mutt. Um, and uh, I, as a kid, I've always been an extremely active boy, uh, participating in like any activity that I ever saw. Um, and I was born with a disability called arthrogryposis. It's a neuromuscular disorder that affects the bones and the joints. So for those that don't know who I am or have never seen me before, I, I use crutches to walk. Um, but since I've been 15 years old, I've been, um, teaching myself how to dance. And so I use my crutches to dance and walk. Um, and I'd say that I've created a pretty unique dance style that's, uh, gotten me recognized a little bit all over the world as a a B-boy that, uh, dances with crutches. Uh, my style in dance is, um, consisted of, of the strength of my arms. Um, I do a lot of like various power moves on the floor and then, uh, I try to repeat those same moves that I do on the floor on my crutches as well. Um, and young Luca is, uh, someone that was ambitious or still is ambitious and, (laughs) um, just is, uh, likes to see the world in many different, uh, views and, uh, is curious to, to experience and try everything. (laughs) <laughs> you you are exactly that I, I would say definitely still ambitious that's that's for sure it you did a beautiful video with your youngest daughter Luna on uh, Arthur Gabriel's Awareness Day June 30th and you explained a little bit about it so I know you touched very briefly but can you let everyone know exactly what it is exactly what it does Um, the fact that you're born with it, um, how you can deal with it. And obviously there's been a lot of medical changes since you yourself were born with it. And now you can, um, you know, have a little bit more uh, with your daughter and you have a little bit more understanding of what it is. And perhaps also let us know, maybe like, did you know about Luna ahead of time? What were you able to do? Just that journey as well. Um, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier, arthrogryposis is a neuromuscular disorder. Um, what makes arthrogryposis so rare for anyone that has it is that it can affect them in any part of their bodies. Um, 
growing up when I was born with arthrogryposis, the doctors actually didn't know what condition I really had. They thought it was a mix between spina bifida, arthrogryposis, and polio, which are three completely different disabilities. Yeah. And it's part of the reason why I had a total of 16 surgeries growing up at such a young age. Wow. Um, in Luna's case, so our youngest daughter, she's currently four months. Uh, she's born with arthrogryposis, just like me. For her, from what we see right now, it affects her just in her legs, very similar to me. Her feet were born in an extreme club foot uh, position, uh, as well as her knees being a little bit more stiff, just like I was when I was born. Um, we actually were able to detect Luna's arthrogryposis, arthrogryposis before she was born. So we saw it in the ultrasounds, and um, thankfully because of that, we were able to build a medical team several months ahead of time. So once Luna was born, we were able to uh, act quickly in um, being able to give her the proper uh, treatments uh, to help her club feet. So just literally uh, two days after her birth, she was casted uh, for her feet. Uh, in the past four months, she's had over 20 casts. She had already her first surgery. And yesterday, Melissa and I actually counted. We've been in the hospital 36 days out of the 120 days. Just a few days. <laughs> of quarantine. Just a few days. <laughs> um, with Luna. And the difference between now and when I was a child was um, back in the day, they were very pro-surgery. And they said, let's try to get as many surgeries out as possible mm. at a young age um, versus now they're more about casting. So they found a technique to make it a lot less invasive to manipulate the feet at such a young age oh. and put them in casts and really try to get the feet in a certain position to avoid surgery. Oh. Um, in Luna's case, they got in three months, they got her feet uh, at, a, like, at a 10 degree angle and unfortunately she needed the surgery. Um, but we would decide to do it now because she's so young that she has, um, I'd, I'd say, the ability to recover quicker. Mm. Um, and obviously, with like at a young age, we want her to avoid the pain, like to not remember it later on. So that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Your amazing wife Melissa said something really cool, which was that she felt like Luna completed the family. <laughs> so there's like a, a really nice how how is Aura been taking to the new baby sister. Do you like being a good big sister? <laughs> Aura's being shy. <laughs> um, Aura is four years old and she's been an amazing big sister to Luna. Uh, she's been a big help for Melissa and I. And Melissa and I actually uh, talk literally every single night about how thankful we are to have Aura with us throughout this journey. Um, at the age that she is to be able to uh, help us and also understand everything that's going on. We mm. feel that if she was a bit younger, it would have been maybe a little bit more harder on Aura and also harder on us on um, making sure that we be able to give to Aura as much attention and energy as we would be to Luna. And um, she's been wonderful throughout this experience. What a girl. You guys need to see her. She's so cute. <laughs> I'm really interested in how you initially reacted. I mean, obviously, it's something that you were born with, you live with, you appreciate, you count as something very much a part of you. Were you afraid that your children would get it? Or what was your initial kind of feeling when you found out that Luna had it also? Um. About Luna having arthrogryposis, yeah. I don't think I was in that much shock. I was like, okay, okay. cool. I think I was more worried about myself oh. in terms of how I would be able to um, give my energy to Luna and do, I guess, that the same justice that my parents did for me, I want to make sure that I can do for Luna. And I think that because I'm also a career-oriented guy, I'm like, oh, well, what does this mean? Do I have to stop dancing, stop touring, so I can make sure that I can be here for Luna? And what's really crazy is that before the whole quarantine, 
aspect, I actually gave myself a good four months break. Mm -hmm. Um, I I told, I told my whole crew, like starting March, mid-March is like, guys, I'm not, I'm not going to go to Hong Kong. I'm not going to go to uh, Norway. There was a couple tours that were lined up for us this spring. I was like, quarantine said no tour anyway. (laughs) And that's, that's, that's the crazy thing was that I was, I was already planning on taking a break and I had already lined it up with my crew and like I had redo getting ready to lead the whole like touring one when I was gone. And then literally Luna was born. And while we were in the hospital was when the whole confinement and shutdown happened. And so we were in the hospital, they were allowing families, but as I got, as we checked in that night, they said, moving forward, if you leave the hospital, you can't get back in. So I stayed in the hospital with Melissa and Luna and we were there for four nights. But I couldn't leave because they weren't allowing pe- like outsiders yeah. to come into the hospital. Oh so it was, it was really like um, perfect timing. And Melissa was saying like, if if Luna had been born one day later, I couldn't have been in the hospital Whoa. with her. So like, uh, it would have been really crazy. So do you see a future dancer? I know Aura dances, but do you see a future dancer in Luna too? All right. Do you think are you are you going to be a dancer one day? Maybe. Or gymnast. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, do you think Luna's going to dance? Or is she going to sing? Oh, I hear she has strong lungs. She has very strong lungs. I hear she has strong lungs. <laughs> yes. does, does Luna cry a lot? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That would be a yes, audience. That would be a yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so so you're going to have a whole Von Trapp full family yeah. of performers. <laughs> now... Speaking of dancing, I know you said you got into it when you were 15. What was the catalyst for that? Why dancing? Why b-boying? How did you get into it? And then how did that evolve into, like you said, your personal style, the crews you were in? I remember back in the day we Illmatic. used to practice, <laughs> yeah, with the Matic styles. I think in the gym of the high school. Yeah. Um, so what brought you to dancing? What was it about b-boying and how did that then evolve? So uh, growing up in Maryland, I lived in a neighborhood where like um, it was very like picturesque style where my next door neighbor was my best friend. Four houses down was my other best friend. Uh, we all had our house, our doors open and any, you can walk in and out of these, our friends' houses. Our parents knew each other. Everyone was like kind of just like that, that friendly like vibe. Yeah. Um, and so with my neighbors, we were skateboarding and rollerblading. And so um, from eight to like 14 years old, I was always on a skateboard. And my neighbors were either on their rollerblades or on a skateboard. And we were going around Bethesda, uh, Washington, D.C., and we were like street skaters, you know, like the typical, like oh what you goodness. would see uh, just like kids just loitering and <laughs> doing, doing bad things and all that stuff. But, oh, that um, and then after having a surgery on my knees, cause I used to skate on my knees. And so like, uh, the reason why I was skating on my knees was cause in the arthrogrip poses, it affected my knees. So I couldn't extend my legs. So I wasn't able to stand fully straight. And so it was easier for me to just to be on my knees and crawling around, uh, to do activities than it would be to try to stand on my crutches. And so um, for the skateboarding, I was doing this on my knees and I was creating this really unique skate style. I was doing all these 50-50s board slides um, and it was like seniors in high school when I was a freshman, they were skating with me too. And it was kind of, we were creating a whole like click and everything. And then after having a surgery on my knees, I could no longer skate anymore because the surgery I had straightened my legs. And so it was too difficult for me to come back onto my knees because it was hurting and I wasn't strong enough to stand up on the skateboard. And so um, my friends who were seniors in high school had just started breaking. And they were like, Luca, if you can't skate, you can break. Mm-hmm. And they showed me how to break. And they we started a club in high school. And it was our just lunch lunchtime club. So oh, we would yeah. just take over a hallway and we would just start dancing. And um, initially, I had absolutely no clue that breaking was part of hip hop. I had okay. no clue that it was a dance. I thought it was just 
people doing cool moves oh. and like just showing off. <laughs> And because I already had a stronger upper body, I had an advantage of being able to do certain moves that my friends couldn't do. Um, and then it was actually when I moved to Montreal that I really recognized breaking was hip hop and the four elements of hip hop. Mm-hmm. And the first event that I ever went to in Montreal in 2002 was Under Pressure, which oh is an gosh. international graffiti festival. Yeah, 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 yeah. And prior to to moving to Montreal, January 2002, I broke my leg in my first battle in Washington, D.C. I was, uh, I was uh, signed up with a, a crew, and we were on the sidelines. We were warming up, and I was, like, getting ready. And I slipped, and I fell, and I broke my leg. And so from January to, you know, I think it was, like, May or June, I was actually in a full body cast recovering from a broken leg. And that year I was graduating high school, but I could no longer go to high school. So I was getting homeschooled. And then I pretty much, my family and I moved to Montreal. So I pretty much left the Washington area with no one knowing what happened. What happened to you? (laughs) You're like an unsolved mystery. (laughs) And I moved to Montreal and I had no friends and I had no community and I had no like, like uh, activity that I could find. And I just wanted to start dancing again. Mm. And so I found out about under pressure. I showed up on this like, super small kid, no one knows. And I'm in Montreal and I'm definitely more Anglophone and like under pressure was very Francophone. And I was just like trying to get myself around. Uh, and I ended up, one of the first dancers I ever met um, was a guy named uh, Monkey. And yeah. he was like so excited and he would just kind of jump in the cypher to let me in because he knew I was shy. Um, and he would like kind of be like, go, go, go show off your stuff. <gasps> And I was just like ciphering that day and I was just showing off. And there there was a battle that ended up happening. And the second dancer I met was Skywalker. Yeah. And he was the one that was taking the registrations. And I like went up to him and was like, um, I, I, I think I want a battle, but I'm scared. <laughs> and uh, and then he's like, he's like, shut up, kid. I put your name in like that, like, like, that. like, yeah. Yeah, like it's basically, over. Like, Sorry. he's like, if, he's like, he basically said, if you're coming to me, it means you want a battle. So yeah. I'm going to register you. Yeah. Amazing. And that day I actually ended up coming in fourth place. Like what? I ended up like passing like two or three rounds and then they had like a four way corn, four corner battle. And, um, it was a, a really cool experience because I feel that to me was my, my, I guess like my, my turning point of mm-hmm. being like, I want to be a dancer. Um, and that's when uh, all I did was like research wherever practices were, wherever events were. And I would did everything I could just to get myself out there in the dance world. Gosh. <laughs> Went from full body cast to fully broken to fully breaking. Um, how did lazy legs come to be? Like, I, is that, like, was that a self-given name? Was that no. someone gave it to you? Yeah, that's what I thought. So let's talk about the name. Because I remember the commercial, Luca, Lazy Legs Pazuelli, B-Boy. Like, I remember that commercial where they pan from your feet up or whatever. It was all these amazing people, like chefs, I think, and all these cool people that had, you know, quote unquote disabilities and you were in this really cool commercial. So how did Lazy Legs come to be? And then um, let's talk about the cruise you are in. Yes. Uh, so Lazy Legs, um, this, I, I got this name early on. Uh, it was uh, the two seniors, uh, Davis Kiyonaga and Will Solomon, that gave me this name. And one day we were just finishing practice at lunch. The bell had rang and Davis was drinking water from the water fountain. And he goes, yo, Luca. I got the perfect name for you. I'm like, what's that? And he's like, lazy legs. I'm like, cool. <laughs> you never questioned it. You just said, okay. I, I thought it was the coolest name ever. And Aww. I remember um, my, my childhood best friend, Jed, uh, he gave me like a Puma jersey uh, that was like good for backspins because it was like nylon. And like, and he's like, he's like, hey, this is my old soccer shirt. And he's like, I want you to have it. And he gave it to me. And literally, the day that he gave it to me, we went to a print shop and I put lazy legs on the hey! back of that shirt. Um, I still have that shirt. Do you shirt. still have it? I was yeah, going to yeah, say, yeah. do you still have it? Yeah, yeah, I still <laughs> have it. It was a white shirt. Now it's yellow because yeah, it's yeah. super dirty and everything <laughs> <laughs> uh, and smelly. But <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Authentic, um, yeah. And um, yeah, I think that name stuck with me. And I, fe- I find that this name describes my personality to people. It tells people I have two lazy legs. I'm okay with it. And mm. I like to 
laugh about it in a certain way. Oh, okay. and, and, and I'm not saying that I'm making fun of myself, but I'm okay to um, admit that uh, yeah. I, I have <laughs> lazy legs. That it, It's not as serious. It's not as no, serious as it, it should be. You yourself are not um, a lazy person. It's just the legs are a little lazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And what about the cruise you've been in? So, <laughs> um, so Elmatic Style is uh, my Montreal-based crew. Yes. Um, and uh, Elmatic Styles was a group before uh, that was an extremely active breaking crew in the West Island of Montreal. And they were doing a lot um, in and around Montreal. And they started traveling to New York and they started getting their name out. And I really wanted to be part of that crew. And so I started becoming friends with the guys. And um, I spent a year with them before joining the crew. They actually asked me to join the crew almost immediately. And I didn't feel comfortable saying yes right away. I was like, let me get to know you. Let's make sure we vibe. And we became like best friends and uh, were Illmatic styles. But with time, some of the members of Illmatic started taking dance less seriously and there was another crew called Red Mask, and they uh, they too were like the best crew in Montreal. So for a good period between like 2003 to 2006, it was either like Elmatic winning battles or Red Mask winning battles. And Red Mask too was, um, they, their members, they were getting less and less. And we had an opportunity to um, team up together and we just like vibed really well. And so we decided to fuse the two crews and we call ourselves Ill Mask now. Um, so Illmask was created in 2006 and, um, or 2005, actually, it was 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, we've really been going more with that label. Um, and then in 2006, I came up with the idea to create Illabilities. Uh, and Illabilities is an international dance crew comprised of differently able dancers. Uh, and the whole idea behind Illabilities is uh, an all-star or super crew of the best b-boys in the world that uh, have different disabilities. Mm. I like you saying differently abled. <laughs> we talk a lot about, you know, disability actually being a superpower. And you've got this slogan, which I love and admire, uh, no excuses, no limits. And I want you to talk a little bit about how that came to be. And then also the recent modifications that you made and why. Yeah, um, so I, I, I speak for myself, but I, I believe that every member in the crew for Ill Abilities feels that our disability gave us a strength to um, discover who we really are. And we don't look at our disability necessarily as a limitation, but more as a superpower. Um, and it's of the idea about learning to do things differently and learning to do things our own way. Um, so each member in the crew, I'll just quickly describe the, the members in the crew and in the countries we represent. Some ill abilities, uh, I, I represent Canada, uh, but there's six other members that represent uh, five other countries. So we have uh, Chicho, he's a dancer from Chile. He was born with a malformation in his legs. He's very short, but he's created a very unique dance style using just his arms. Uh, we have two dancers from Brazil, Samuka and Perninha. Samuka is a cancer survivor. So he's a, he had um, osteosarcoma. He had a tumor growing the size of a golf ball wow. just, above, just below his hip. And he basically had the same cancer that our hero Terry Fox had. Right. Uh, and so he had to amputate his leg just like Terry Fox. Uh, Samuka created a really fast and explosive dance style, all with one leg. Um, Per Nina is a dancer from Brazil as well, and he was born with a malformation in one of his legs. Basically, he's got one leg very similar to Chicho, mm -hmm. and the other leg just like an average person's leg. Okay. And when he's dancing, his average leg is always bent to be able to match the shorter leg. So Per Nina stands for little leg. Oh, and cool. Per Nina has created a, a dance style in breaking that is starting to become recognized and no one can really replicate the movements that he's doing because it's like it's like he can stand up and look very tall or he can be really short yeah. and it's like this really cool like effects that he does yeah. with his movements um we have a dancer from the u.s his name is cujo uh, from los angeles cujo is a hearing impaired dancer but he's actually a legend in the breaking world he's been dancing for over 25 years he's 43 years old 
and he's uh, inspired and influenced thousands of dancers uh, with a different style. And it was all because he couldn't hear the music. So he basically created his own style and um, compensated from the foundational movements to do more uh, unorthodox movements uh, by throwing his body around in like really different and awkward positions. But it got recognized and it made him become a, a leader within the breaking world. We have another dancer from Holland. His name is Ridu. Ridu was born with many malformations all over his body. Um, he's got two fingers on one hand, three fingers on the other. He's got a shorter right elbow. Uh, a sh he's missing a hip. He's got one leg shorter than the other, and he uses a prosthetic leg to walk. Wow. To me, Ridu is probably one of the best dancers in Europe uh, at this moment, and not just in breaking, but in dance in general. He built a 30-minute solo, um, which he started touring all over Europe. He recently got nominated, or he won the Swan Award as um, the best dancer uh, for his show. Um, and uh, him, when you're watching him dance, him too, it's this illusion that you can't even tell he has any limitation because he's dancing so fast and so smooth that people only, they see his little arm, but they don't recognize all of the other uh, malformations. And uh, the last dancer in our crew, we call him the Miracle Boy. His name is Crops from Korea. Crops uh, was born without a disability, but he was on his way to become one of the best b-boys in the world. He's part of Fusion MC crew. Um, he was uh, lined up to be part of the Red Bull BC1 World Finals. He was like doing really well. He was at a rehearsal. He slipped, fell, broke his neck, became completely paralyzed. He spent over a year in the hospital. Um, the doctors told him he'd never be able to walk again. And basically, if anyone's ever seen Kill Bill, basically... Um, Crops went through the same situation that uh, Kill Bill, um, she, uh, Uma Thurman, when yeah. she had to move her feet slowly, slowly and move her hands and like get out of the bed, but she fell down, but like kept on fighting and working for it and got back up. So Crops had that same, or not the same, but similar uh, lifestyle where he had to literally relearn everything from the beginning. And he knew that going back in the dance world would be a huge challenge. Mm. But he taught himself how to DJ because he always wanted to stay connected to the hip hop world. Nice. And his rehab, because when you, you become paralyzed, you actually end up losing sensors in your fingers. And so actually part of his rehab is to learn how to scratch and grab the fader to go side to side. And that was like helping him. And he's currently one of South Korea's best breaking DJs. And about four years ago, he actually started dancing again. And so... He's not dancing at the same level as he was, but we've incorporated him in our theater show, and he has a really beautiful, like, contemporary breaking solo. Um, and so as a crew, we come together to share our stories um, in a theatrical way, but also through motivational speaking and through teaching. Um, and uh, I think for us, this message, no excuses, no limits, that we share is the idea that in life, anything is possible as long as we take the time to learn to do things our own way. And just because something is different, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's more about discovering what works for you and finding a way to do it your way. Because if you do it enough where you believe that you're doing it, others around you will start believing that you're doing it. Goodness. And so that's the whole concept and idea behind No Excuses, No Limits. <laughs> it's incredible. All of you are incredible. I remember coming to watch the big fundraiser show. Yeah. I, I got that auction shirt. Yeah, yeah. I got the t-shirt. Oh my God, with all of you guys, your name signed on. It's so amazing what you've created. I mean, I remember watching you uh, when we were practicing in the high school. What was it St. Thomas? Where were we? Yeah, St. Like Thomas High School, just practicing. You know, you were just uh, Luca to me. Yeah. And, it was every Tuesday, so we would always tell each other, happy, happy Tuesday. Tuesday. And now every time we see each other, it's happy Tuesday, regardless of what day of the week it is. Your particular vibe and dance style has always been to incorporate other things. I find you a bit of like a prop master, to be honest. You'll use, you know, you have your braces, but you use your crutches and you experiment sometimes with the chair. But um, I even remember there was like a special pedal on your car so that you could drive the car. 
Um, but there were two major moments for, for me, at least, that I remember. You might have more where you vowed to walk. One was walking down the aisle, yeah. I remember. <laughs> and then one was the, the big walk you did. Um, what was that, for Rad? Like, that was... It was uh, yeah, it was, it was for Rad. It was just an event we called the Diffuse Peu. Yes, Diffuse Peu. So can you talk about what it took for you to prep walking down the aisle and then prep that giant walk uh, in the old park? Because that was massive. <laughs> Even for anybody, like, that was a huge walk. But you did two amazing things. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so... Growing up, my dream has always been to walk. Uh, so uh, any, anything I've ever wanted to do is anytime I see the first star in the sky, I say, I wish I could walk. Anytime I blow my birthday candles, I say, I wish I could walk. And um, when I first moved to Montreal, we actually um, met a, a, a personal trainer who was like determined to, to help me get to that point. Wow. And so I started working out with him. And I think Prior to him, all my therapy sessions or all my like training sessions were always, always focused on just my legs. And what he did was he worked on my whole body and he taught me like the importance of a core. And he goes, without a core, you're not going to be able to stand basically. Mm -hmm. And so we started working a lot on all of that. And because of that, I was learning to stand through him. Um, and uh, then slowly, slowly we started practicing. I was able to just keep my hands on my knees and walking by like having my hands support like the pressure on my knees and I was doing like these steps in the gym with my trainer. And um, then slowly, slowly, I was getting more and more confidence to be able to let my knees, like let my hands out of my knees and start taking more and more steps. And so uh, on October 12th, 2013, I married Melissa Emblen. And so I, I got to walk down the aisle uh, without my crutches and my, just my cane. Um, and that was a special moment. It was very emotional <laughs> on, many, on many occasions. But then on July 26, 2014, um, I gave myself a challenge to walk um, 2.5 kilometers without my crutches and without my leg braces. And um, prior to this big 2.5 kilometer walk, um, I actually did a one kilometer walk in 2010 for the Arthur Poses Foundation on Arthur Poses Day. Amazing. And then the, the year before, I did a half kilometer walk uh, in Halifax, part of the Buskers Festival, uh, which I ended up getting um, heat exhaustion and uh, dehydration. <laughs> so, um, awesome. And then, uh, but in 2014, I really wanted to do a walk and it wasn't necessarily the distance but it was an event to bring people together. And it was called the Diffuse Peu. And the reason why we called it the Diffuse Peu was we wanted to invite individuals to walk for themselves and share something that they've always wanted to do and accomplish. And together with the people around us, we would share those dreams and those um, beliefs and whatever they were. And it literally could be anything. It could be, I want to quit smoking, or it could be, I want to graduate school, or I want a girlfriend, whatever those things were is that together we would just push each other to accomplish those beliefs. And what was really amazing was that that day we had almost 800 people show up in old Montreal. And uh, it was a really magical day. I accomplished the 2.5K. It took me about two and a half hours. I fell probably 100 times. Um, and I actually ended up having uh, some like deterioration in my knee joints uh, and in my back. So I had a lot of pain. So for a full year, I actually couldn't walk. After oh, that so, walk. Super, super worth it. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, Got it. And, and so I was, I was relying a lot on my leg braces and um, on my crutches because there was like an extraordinary amount of pain after that whole uh, event. But what was more magical for me about me going through that 2.5K was actually my students. Um, that some of my students challenged themselves and they got out of their wheelchairs. They were using rolling walkers or I had one um, student who uh, he uh, normally uses a wheelchair. He's uh, missing his bottom limbs and he did half of the walk just on his hands oh and gosh. everything like that. And um, it was really cool because it was also like as we're walking through old Montreal, I could hear people saying like, "What's this protest?" People thought we were like protesting, <laughs> and it's like it's a really no. slow protest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a really slow motion. Slow motion protest. 
And, yeah. um, and it was like, it was interesting because we, we did it where it was like announced, but unannounced and like unprepared and prepared. Like it was, yeah. re- it was like really well organized, but yet like people in old Montreal didn't know what was going on. So like the, the merchants and all that stuff thought like something like bad was happening. <laughs> and like they thought they had to call the police and then they realized it was just really, uh, uh, I, I find that it was a day where like literally no matter what age, what race, what gender, what ability one had, people were there yeah. just celebrating life. And that's what I think for me, my mission has always been to just bring people together. I don't care who you are. If you just want to just have fun and listen to good music and just move, then let's get together and just jam. Thank you. No, it was such a great event. I remember I was there when you finished. I was crying. <laughs> then I had to perform. Anyway, it was, but it was great. And so, okay, so maybe not another two point five k walk anytime soon is what you're saying. No, you know what I think. I, what I, what I want to do right now, like, like physically and mentally, I'm not there. Um, but one of my long term things that I want to do is actually do walk across the island of Montreal. But I'd be using my crutches and. Mm-hmm. Um, like a bike I would make it kind of like a triathlon type oh, of nice. thing like even use a wheelchair but just the idea of, of going through that distance from one end of this island to the other end of the island and as much as I want to make it an event and bring people with me and, and it would be one of those things where anyone can come I think I would watch this time around I would want to do it more just for myself yeah so I could see that yeah that's amazing make your own triathlon I enjoy that very much <laughs> I want to bring a little bit of awareness to, you know, we talked a lot about the dance community. Um, Let's backtrack a little bit in the sense of what are some simple things that people without disabilities don't really have to consider on the daily? I want to bring some overall awareness right now. And then you can be more specific later to the dance community itself, but just in everyday life, like what are some things that people don't even consider that you would love them to be a little bit more aware of? Um, I mean, I think, I think that it's, it's a, a great discussion. And I think that one of the things that I'm talking for myself or my own experiences, but I can't talk for everyone in the disabled community because there's so many different types of disabilities. And I think that just the, the, if I'm, if I'm going to answer just a broad one for people with disabilities, and this is, um, mixing both physical and intellectual uh, disabilities Mm -hmm. is I think that as a society for people that are, don't have a disability to understand and take patience or like have patience with people in general, because at the end of the day, you don't know what that person is going through behind the scenes. Um, And so I find in, in public situations you know, if, if you're waiting in line and it takes you that one extra step and you go a little bit slower and that person behind you is pushing you, like it, it can create like anxiety and stress and, and, and that type of stuff. Or um, if you ask someone a question and you don't get the response immediately, it might just be because that person is processing that question. And so before like shutting a person down um, and assuming that they can't do something give that person that time to be able to respond or react Mm -hmm. to a situation. Um, You know, if I speak for Cujo's uh, situation, Cujo's hearing impaired. So what's really challenging about Cujo is that he can actually talk with his voice. And if you're close enough to him, he can hear you because he has a hearing aid. But if he has his back towards you and you're talking to to him, he can't hear a thing. So often people will talk to him and he can't hear you. And people assume that he's either ignoring you or that he's... Uh, intellectually challenged or they 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 become really mean towards him you know and he ends up getting bullied or mistreated and I find that often uh you know with people that either are hearing impaired or um that have cognitive delays and so it's take the time to understand the person before making any assumption on mm-hmm. them and I, I would say that that's my general that's uh, aspect you know and i can give just a quick little like recurrent thing that's happening with with the whole covid thing right yeah, yeah, um yeah. you're going into stores and so every store has a completely different policy and process airport security same type of similar very similar situation as a person with a disability it becomes challenging because 
if at one store you're going to treat the situation in a specific way, then I, my assumption would be that the next store that I go to would, should be somewhat similar. Um, and just to give you an example, having to clean your hands. So um, there, I remember specifically there was one place where I couldn't cross the line. The woman had to reach from very far away. I had to wash my hands, but it was like a super sticky type of like liquid. And then I had to walk over to a table to dry my hands and throw them out. But I couldn't put my hands on my crutches. So I had to get the woman to go and bring me like the mm-hmm. towel. And she was scared to do it because she was scared to get close to me. Yeah. And I was just like, in terms of, I guess, education wise, it's like, well, you should be able to observe that everyone has different like handles of things. And like, so it's, it's more about like educating society on how, um, how to treat each situation to like, to like, like situation specific. Situation specific. Yeah. Situation, I like that, situation specific, and also to, uh, we don't know until we know, and then when we know, we do better. So if you see a certain scenario and you realize, oh, this is not working for certain reasons, there's no problem adjusting and changing. Like, we have to not be so set in our ways also to not, you know, have the humbleness and understanding to switch something up if it isn't working, you know? Like, there's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah. And specifically in the dance community, you mentioned something very interesting to me. And I think you have a fun story about uh, a stage performance and talking about theaters and people with disabilities. Yeah. So when I first started my career and before, like, people in Montreal knew who Lazy Legs was, I um, was doing a show with uh, two of my friends. And it was a year-end dance studio show. And I was the first to arrive. And the owner of the dance studio was at the artist stage door and I'm trying to walk in and the, the owner of the dance studio had no clue who I was and she's like oh no um the audience doesn't arrive for another couple hours uh I'm like oh no I'm a performer and right away she goes oh did you get injured I'm like no I was born this way <laughs> I, I'm a dancer she's like and she just laughs she's like yeah right and she's like here if you want to grab a seat and she was like trying to act like she was going to give me like a VIP treatment and I could have like a, a, she thought I was trying to sneak in or I don't know what it was but basically then my two friends show up and they ask where I am and and she's like oh the guy on crutches I had him seated because he's injured and they're like no no he's a dancer and basically I had to prove myself to this oh my God. <laughs> <You're doing laughs> yeah. but but what was really nice was that at the end of the performance she just started crying and she gave me a big hug and she goes I feel so stupid and she's like out of all people I should be the last person to be judging uh dancers and so like it was a really like powerful moment in in my career to recognize that okay well not everyone is used to seeing different bodies on stage um and one of our missions with the abilities and also with Poche Rad and and with uh, my wife Melissa and I we want to always make an effort to bring inclusion and integration with on like within a stage and one of the biggest challenges that we find within the dance world or in the theater world, not even just theaters in general, is that theaters are promoted to be accessible, but only the audience part is accessible. Mm. Uh, usually like the stage door, uh, there's stairs, or you have your backstage um, green room that is like the doors aren't wide enough, or there's something that doesn't make it fully accessible to allow a person with a disability uh, to get onto the stage and perform. And so that's one of the things that we've worked really hard on is communicating with theaters. And if theaters don't have the appropriate equipment, then we would go out of our way and like provide ramps or we would um, have ways of like, uh, there was one theater specifically that like they had us come a little bit before everyone and they used the mon charge and the mon charge is like illegal to have people on there but they're like look if no one's here like we'll do it like we really want your students to perform and like we were able to get our students to perform and everything and like so what i find a lot now is that theaters are doing their best to try to find solutions um obviously like not quick enough but yeah. at the same time what i've learned throughout my journey is that if you take the time to talk with the other side will say in a way that they can understand and empathize with your needs, then 
majority of the people will try to find a solution to help accommodate you. Mm -hmm. Um, And if it means like, uh, you know, uh, adding ramps. So like with with you, Julia, like we actually ended up um, one of our rad programs, we had them at, at your studios. Yeah. And the first thing I noticed when we walked in, I was like, hey, there's stairs to get in. Yeah. How are our students yeah. going to get in? Straight up. And um, like within like two weeks, you talked to the manager yeah. and, and you were able to get a ramp installed yeah. <laughs> at the main entrance. Yep. And, and I think it's all in the communication, how you communicate for those changes. I think a lot of us in the society assume that the government's are responsible to do all of that and yes for a large part of it they are but i also think that a lot of it is community oriented and if you just talk to your neighbor then they can help make those adjustments one one thousand percent we're always saying that communication is key and you can't just assume that someone knows what you know or feels what you feel or will react the way you react like you are not them they are not you and that building that we used to be in with the old studio never had that issue because nobody ever came by in a wheelchair or in, let's say, permanent crutches. Um, and the, once we brought it up to them, they they kind of said, oh, holy crap, you know what? You're absolutely right. Let's put that in there. I remember my brother and father made like a temporary one for your first yeah. rad class. We could just get up there. And then from there, now that building literally has a permanent ramp because you guys mentioned something. So Let's communicate more. Let's inform people. Let's educate people of what it is that we can do. And exactly like you've been saying, let's have a calm and kind conversation because just like you said, with people with certain, you know, uh, different abilities or disabilities, um, we don't always know their story. So we don't always know the story of the people we're talking to, and they might just genuinely not know. Sometimes we're like, how do you not know? But sometimes people just don't. When it comes to that, in a higher level, have you ever faced any major injustices in the dance community because of your disability? Um, major injustices? It depends on how you look at it. Because mm-hmm. uh, I remember a couple of occasions where when my first video came out, there was a lot of comments. I'd say 95% of the comments were all positive. Like, oh my God, he's super cool, super strong. And then like 5% of them was like, oh, he's faking it. He's not a real B-boy. He can move his legs. Uh, like. All of these, like, you know, typical, like, internet troll, like, comments and all all of that stuff. Um, And then I remember when I first moved to Montreal, again, majority of the community was super positive. And they were all, like, wanting me, pushing me and everything. And I remember there was a certain group of B-boys that were more like, uh, he ain't a real B-boy. And I remember one time I was doing the move and there was a moment where like the, the beat just dropped. So there was a kind of like a silence and I was doing like, um, like a levitating, like planche move where I go from side to side. And what this one person goes, lazy, you, you're not a real B-boy. That's not breaking when I was doing that move. Cause to them it was more like gymnastics. Mm-hmm. And I remember like, I heard it. And I remember I've, I've always been like a positive guy, but in the back of my head, I'm like, Asshole, I'm gonna battle the shit out of you, like, yeah. you know what I mean? like, and um, a lot of people went up to that that person and they they talked to him and they're like, "Yo, how could you say that about Lazy?" And he's like, "Oh, well, to me, he's not a real b boy. He's not listening to the music. He's not dancing." Da, da, da. And he ended up talking to me, and I still held a grudge with him at that time, and I ended up understanding where he was coming from. And I think that, in a certain sense, gave me that fire, mm. and I became more competitive, mm. and I started training harder, and I started proving myself to him. And when I felt ready, literally, I was just like, you think I'm not a B-boy? And we were just in the asphalt, and we went 10 rounds, and I battled him. And anyone that's ever questioned that of me is, I'll battle you. I might not win, and I don't care. But I'll do it it because I do believe I'm a B-boy. And I think that, like, who are you to question that? Like, Mm -hmm. I guess, you know what I mean? And and so it's like I'll put myself on the line and I'll battle it out and I'll go as long as I can and as long as I have to. And um, I I do believe I've, I've put enough blood, sweat, and tears within this dance to, to be able to be a b-boy <laughs> 1000 percent, and you're not you're not just doing trickery in in my eyes you 
you are literally doing your up rocks with your crutches and you're on the music and you're taking things to the ground and you're doing your floor work and you're doing your power moves and you're, you know, you're doing all of these ingenious things to the music, to the beats, you know, feeling whatever the vibe is. And you're also not, you're battling everyone. You're literally battling everyone. Like you're not only battling, you know, other dancers per se with different abilities, disabilities. You are, you're like, I'll take on anybody. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And like you said, win or lose, I'm in this for the love of it. You yeah. know, that's exactly who you are and who I've always kind of admired. And you've grown, listen, 18 years later, you've grown into a uh, husband, father, a motivational speaker, a leader, um, dancer extraordinaire. You've um, started foundations and fundraisers and inspired people all over the world to do all kinds of amazing things. Um is that how you see yourself, yeah. first of all? And then with all of these amazing things that you've accomplished, what would be your hopes now for the future? <laughs> um, Big one. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know how I see myself in the sense that, like, yeah, I guess now I'm, like, I'm turning 36 in a couple of days and I'm, like, reflecting and being like, oh, man, I was like, actually, I've done a lot. <laughs> I've done a lot. <laughs> um, and... Um, I think that I always want this dance to be a part of me no matter what and no matter how old I am and, and, and all of that. And I, uh, I think right now, maybe it's the fatigue and the lack of sleep. <laughs> I, I, I am a little lost in terms of where I'm going with my career and, and what I'm doing and, um, the focus on the family and, and, and all of that, like, but I, uh, I've been putting a lot of energy in trying to find ways to move differently. So I've been using a wheelchair recently and incorporating, uh, movements, um, in, in, in a different way than you would see, uh, a, a wheelchair being used or dance on a wheelchair yeah, the, yeah, the way yeah. that would be. Um, I'm trying to find different, uh, techniques with my crutches, I think also maybe my body, I'm feeling a little bit heavier. I'm feeling a little bit COVID older. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm uh, feeling that I don't have that same energy that I used to have. So I'm trying to find ways of moving differently to adapt to the changes that my body mm. is having. But I want to continue moving and I want to continue choreographing. So I'm spending a lot of time working and building like concepts with my students um i have a group of students that i believe uh have the potential of of becoming professional dancers so i want to give them those tools uh to continue dance and, and build a project Amazing. with them um and then the rest right now to be honest is, is a lot of it is really just family oriented and my, okay. and my energy is just on on my two daughters on aura and luna and uh just maintaining a home <laughs> with, with my That's wife Lisa. yeah so. I think a lot of artists need to realize that that type of stuff is important too. And in quarantine, especially, we've had so much time to self-reflect and a lot of people have gone through major internal journeys yeah. and you, you know, talking about different ways to move on the wheelchair, it's adapting to how your body and how your mind are feeling. And that is okay. We can, we can try new things. We can adapt. We can understand that our bodies at the ages of 36 <laughs> are not the same as they used to be. Yeah. <laughs> and we're allowed to kind of alter how we're feeling, but it's beautiful that you want to spend that time um, with your family. Um, quick shout out to Melissa. We love her very much. Um, to Luna and Aura as well. Of course, your parents. Ciao. <laughs> if they're going to listen. Um, before I let you go, of course, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate Pleasure. you. I love you dearly. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final words of wisdom? Final words of wisdom. Or not so much <laughs> wisdom. Whatever. Final words. <laughs> well, you, you said something is about uh, what I want to accomplish I guess later on in my life um I've been uh like writing this idea and concept about organic inclusion mm. and and so I find that um inclusion is a huge topic especially right now with everything that's going on in the world and I'm a strong promoter strong ambassador for inclusion but I find that when it's forced onto people or obligated uh that the inclusion ends up becoming more fake and it's less sincere that if we as a society can learn to just include people naturally and organically, then we won't really have 
are, I think, the challenges of marginalized, marginalized communities will become less because as as a society will become more aware of everyone's um, background and environments and experiences that we can become a stronger society. Mm. And so that's something that I'm, I'm a strong promoter of and I have no clue how it will come about, but I do believe that hip hop is the catalyst for organic inclusion. And it's the one thing that really brings people together. Um, so I, I'm extremely thankful to be part of this community. And um, I think that anyone out there in this world, especially with what's going on right now with COVID, whether you're a dancer or not, we're currently in a moment where we have to adjust our lifestyle. And we shouldn't fear the change. We should find a way to learn to embrace it, build off of it, and evolve as a society. So, yeah. oh, that's so good. That's so good. Those were actual final words of wisdom. Aura, do you have any final words? Want to say bye? Just say bye. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> so close, guys. So close. One day she'll be talking so much and we won't be able to <laughs> keep her quiet. I thank you so much for being here. I love you dearly. I love that so much. much. Organic inclusion. Let's remember that. That's a really good one. Thank you so much and all the best to everyone. And I hope everyone is uh, safe and well. Peace. So as we are starting to understand that our disabilities, our differences, and our different abilities are what make us wonderful. They're what makes me me. And they're what makes you you. And if you are not quite there yet, just know it's all part of the process. I hope one day soon, though, you can see it. Because being uniquely you is truly the best part.